Ship 39 was ready to fly. The vehicle was stacked back in November. Final hardware? Done about a week ago. Everything looked good for Flight 12 happening soon. Then, scaffolding showed up overnight. Not just anywhere, around critical structural sections. And suddenly, test tanks at Massey's started getting hammered with cryo-tests, one after another. Flight 12? Now it's sitting in limbo with no launch date. Here's the thing. After losing Ship 36 and Booster 18 to the exact same problem, SpaceX found something in Ship 39 that made them stop everything. They had a choice. Stick to the schedule and hope for the best, or hit pause and fix whatever they found before it's too late. So what did they actually discover that changed everything? Look at where that scaffolding went up. It's not random. It's right around the structural interfaces and high load areas. You know, the parts of the ship that take the most beating during flight and especially re-entry. Scaffolding this late in the build process means one thing. They need to get under those heat shield tiles. And that's unusual. Once tiles go on and pass inspection, they generally stay on. You don't remove them unless testing shows a problem. But SpaceX is pulling tiles off before they've even done cryo-proof tests. That tells me they already knew something had to change. How did they know? That's where things get interesting. For weeks now, ship test tank 18 has been going through cryo-cycle after cryo-cycle at Massey's. This isn't just checking boxes. They're really pushing this thing. Fill it with cryo-propellants, pressurize it, thermal cycle it, stress it, repeat. They're hunting for the breaking points. All that data on strain, reinforcement, failure margins. They're getting it from the test tank so they don't have to learn it the hard way on ship 39. Think about what that means. You've got a $100 million flight vehicle sitting there. Do you load it up and hope the structure holds? Or do you beat up a test tank first and use that data to modify Ship 39 before testing? SpaceX chose the second option. That's why we're seeing the delay and the scaffolding. Any structural changes underneath mean tiles come off, mods get made, Tiles go back on with perfect precision. Now here's what really caught my attention. Test tank SN2 just showed up at Massey's this week. This one has block 3 features in the aft section. To me, that says SpaceX is still working through the block 3 design. They're not just validating what they already know. They're learning and adjusting as test data comes in. Ship 39 waits until they've got all the answers. There's another angle to consider. Ship 39 is the first Block 3 flight article. When you change the structure, different load paths, new reinforcements, tweaked geometry, those heat shield tiles might not fit quite right anymore. The tiles and insulation layers were designed for the old configuration. Even tiny gaps between tiles during re-entry? That's plasma getting through. That's mission over. So if tiles don't align properly, they have to come off and get reinstalled correctly. This isn't a screw-up in the design. It's just what happens when you build the first one of anything new. You find out where theory meets reality. Meanwhile, Booster 19 is moving along at record speed. 28 days from start to stack. It's already heading toward cryo-testing. Why can the booster sprint ahead while the ship sits there waiting? Different risk profiles. Booster 19 has mostly proven design elements, plus one major upgrade, those new COPVs with the red casing. Same ones that are now on ship 39. But here's the key difference. The COPV issue is a known problem with a validated solution. 
SpaceX built dedicated test bays for these pressure vessels. They're testing each one individually under flight conditions before it goes on hardware. The booster can move fast because they know what they're dealing with. Ship 39? That's the first flight vehicle with full Block 3 structural changes. There's no flight data on how these structures perform under real combined loads. That's why test tanks go first. Let me talk about these COPVs for a second, because they're the reason SpaceX changed how they validate everything. These pressure vessels hold helium at up to 6,000 PSI. They don't fail gently. When they go, they rupture instantly and release all that stored energy at once. Ship 36? COPV failure. Booster 18? Same thing. Both vehicles completely destroyed. And here's what makes those failures really sting. These components passed all the supplier qualification tests. They met specs, passed inspections, and then failed anyway during actual operations. That's a wake-up call. SpaceX's response wasn't just ordering new parts. They built their own test bays at Massey's to proof-test every single COPV before installation. They're not trusting supplier certifications anymore. They're validating everything themselves. That's a major change in how they operate. 36 and Booster 18 probably cost 200 to 300 million dollars in hardware alone. But the real cost? Time. Investigations, redesigns, additional testing, delays across the whole program. When you lose a vehicle, you don't just build another one. You have to figure out why it failed, fix the design, validate the fix, then rebuild everyone's confidence in the system and you lose all forward momentum. SpaceX built their early Starship program on speed. Build fast, test fast, learn from failures, iterate quickly. That worked great when failures were expected and each one taught you something new. But there's a line where failures stop being useful and start being setbacks. Two vehicles lost to the same problem that crosses the line. What makes it tougher is these weren't experimental SpaceX prototypes. These were aerospace-grade parts from experienced suppliers. If those can fail, what else might not be capturing real flight conditions in the qualification process? So SpaceX took ownership. Test bays for COPVs, extensive test tank campaigns, Willingness to delay Ship 39 until they understand the structure completely. They're spending time up front now instead of discovering problems during flight tests. Is it slower? Sure looks that way. But here's my take. Preventing another failure saves way more time than it costs. Every vehicle loss shuts down all testing while investigations run. Redesigns ripple through multiple vehicles downstream. Decision-making slows across the program while confidence rebuilds. Spending extra weeks testing Ship 39 properly means higher confidence in Block 3, smoother progress through Flight 12 and beyond, and less chance of another investigation-driven pause. Slower pace now, but more disciplined engineering that gets to operational capability faster in the end. That's the real story. SpaceX learned some expensive lessons and decided to apply them before the next failure, not after. Block 3 matters here because it's not just small improvements. This is a structural redesign of how the upper stage handles loads during ascent, re-entry and landing. Better load paths mean less structural mass, more payload capacity. But changing load paths means changing stringers, ring frames, tank walls, attachment points, all through the vehicle. Ship 39 is the first one built this way. There's no flight data on how Block 3 actually performs under real conditions. Running test tanks through multiple cryocycles gives them that data. 
how the structure responds to thermal stress, pressure loads, strain accumulation. They're measuring deflections, watching for potential failures, checking that reinforcements work like they're supposed to. Once they've got all that data analyzed, Ship 39 moves forward. This is normal for the first vehicle of a new configuration. The question is always, do you find and fix issues on the ground, or do you discover them during flight? The scaffolding around Ship 39 tells us which path SpaceX chose, and after losing two vehicles quickly, I think it's the right call. So what's really happening with Ship 39? It's not some catastrophic problem, it's SpaceX finding potential issues before they become catastrophic. After watching two vehicles explode from the same failure, they made a choice. Keep pushing on schedule and risk another loss, or take time now to validate everything properly. The scaffolding, the test tanks getting hammered at Massey's, the delayed timeline, these aren't crisis signals. This is what disciplined engineering looks like. Here's how I see it. That aggressive, move fast and break things approach. It worked great early on when every failure taught them something valuable. But losing two production vehicles to the same component failure changed the equation. Those weren't learning opportunities. They were expensive setbacks that cost way more than taking a few extra weeks to test properly. SpaceX is maturing building dedicated test facilities, running test articles through failure scenarios, refusing to fly until the data confirms everything works. Yes, it's slower. Flight 12 won't happen as soon as we thought, but this prevents the kind of catastrophic failures that shut down the whole program for months. Ship 39 flies when it's ready, not when the calendar says it should. That's how you build something reliable. The next few weeks will tell us a lot. Once test tank SN2 finishes its campaign and SpaceX incorporates everything they learned into Ship 39, we'll see the vehicle head toward cryo-testing with a lot more confidence. When Flight 12 eventually launches, it won't just be another test flight. It'll prove SpaceX can learn from failures and actually implement those lessons. If this analysis helped you understand what's really going on, hit that like button and share this with anyone following Starship. Drop a comment. Do you think SpaceX made the right call delaying Ship 39? Should they have kept the aggressive pace? I really want to know what you think. And if you haven't subscribed to New Space Review yet, do that now and turn on notifications. You don't want to miss what happens as Ship 39 moves through testing and eventually toward Flight 12. Thanks for being here and being part of a community that cares about accurate, in-depth coverage of what's happening in space. Before you go, there's another video on your screen about Ship 39 and Flight 12's timeline. Check that out. See you in the next one.